feel that we are all collectively responsible to do something about what is happening here. Yeah. So it's, um, it's not just the duty of the police, it's not just the duty of the, the future mayor or the mayor or London or whoever. We collectively have to take responsibility. And I hope that we are to do so too. Um, next question uh, before I pass it over to Imam Hashim. Um, the Muslim community has suffered from a perception problem, and are seen by some perhaps as being too risky, which began after 9 11 and 7 7. Uh, as a result, even statutory agencies, but not happening, have sometimes not wanted to fund Muslim groups uh, in the fear that their fingers may get burnt. An article, for example, uh, on a slightly different matter in the London's Evening Standard stated that candidates with Muslim sounding names are three times as likely to be cast over for jobs. What would you do as mayor to combat Islamophobia and ensure that all members of the community have a fair chance in life? I'd like to say that is a problem with Muslim and black cultures. If your name is sounding a certain way, your job's not, the job's not yours. If you come from a certain postcode, the job's not yours. For me, it's integration. We really have to pull together more community projects. This is the time. This is the time. I mean, I'm hearing all the churches saying this is the time of revelation. Well, we're all religious people in here. We all know whether if, if you praise Allah or, or Muhammad or you praise Christ, whatever it is, we all know the Bible has a beginning and it has a an end. And we're at the terrible end of it at the moment, where we're having all these things thrown at us and we really have to work for our rights. So as far as combating Islamophobia, I feel that we have to do more of these events within our borough. We have to connect with each other. Because as they say, it takes a village to raise a child. Here's our village, so let's raise the children like-minded. It's changing the mindset of people. And we're not doing enough of that sort of outreach to change the mindset. Once you change the mindset, people will be walking down the road waving to each other. They go to universities together. They go to school together. They're starting life at nursery together. So why is it when we become adults, it all becomes a problem? There is good and there is bad in every culture you, and in every religion. Um, I want to say something a bit more positive, which is that when I was growing up in the 70s, I'm from a Hindu family, I've been called nothing Paki in the street. This, what we now call Islamophobia is what we used to call racism. And we need to not overreact to it. Our community has been dealing with racism and abuse for many generations, and our families have well established themselves. So I don't want there to be panic about Islamophobia. No. There's a lot of resilience here. We also need to look at the different ways it manifests. So we talk about employment. Here's a, the fourth society. We've had all the gender pay gap data. The government hasn't been interested in the race pay gap. There's, I can show you later the pay gap between the white British male and a Muslim or Pakistani or Bangladeshi, and I use that, that's the only category, well, obviously many people in those communities are Muslim. Why is that not spoken about? Why is that not a cause for concern? It's an even bigger gap if you look at the opportunities to earn available to Muslim women. And that's another, that comes back to our policy in childcare. I'm a governor at London Met University, and when we are measured and rated in all the university rankings about its own um, employment prospects, and we talk openly as a board of governors, our students, most of whom are not white, don't get a fair say on the labour market, and we have to train and make our university policies according to that. There are wonderful organisations like Talmama speaking out, uniting people to talk about racism and Islamophobia. We need to be together, but what's wonderful compared to when I was growing up in the 70s is that we now can speak about it without being ashamed. We can get together, different communities can get together and talk about prejudice and racism. And we can produce these charts for ourselves and talk to the powers that be about the unfairnesses that we face. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, so I think it's really important that it's, you know, it's a community-led uh, effort to fight uh, racism, Islamophobia, uh, anti-Semitism. I think it's really important that we don't try and impose something, um, you know, in the same ways we've imposed some legislation nationally that uh, the Green Party stands against, like the Prevent Strategy, which has not been about working with communities, it's about being putting something onto communities. And obviously a lot of the things that are coming from national government, also coming from the media, are very demonizing and it's, and it's unacceptable. We need to say that that's, uh, that's really bad when you say it loudly and proudly. I think we also have a really good opportunity to, uh, to come back against this and to, to fight back. Uh, we've got this massive refugee influx at the minute. We've got a crisis and that hasn't gone away just because it's not in the newspapers anymore. And I think Hackney's, Hackney's really welcoming to refugees and has been historically. And we should be really proud of that and do more of that. And where we've got communities coming together saying, bring us refugees, we need to facilitate that as much as possible. And then they can be really good uh, advocates in all kind, different kinds of communities. Thank you very much. Uh, my pedigree in defending Muslims is pretty well established. In the 70s, as a student, I put myself at risk going down to Brick Lane to defend um, Bengalis, um, facing um, weekly surges and charges of uh, right wing fascists. Uh, knocking, racing down Brick Lane, knocking everything and everyone in sight. But the issue is, what would I do if you good people were to let me as men? Well, in my manifesto, I've stated that um, I would not only reveal every um, privatized and outsourcing contracts, but I would allow a fair access to the many millions of pounds in contracts that Hackney Council uh, you know, produces each year. And unfortunately, um, the, the, the bidding process is not fair. Um, my friend uh, Philip Granville may well uh, say something different, but it's not fair. And for me, I would like to see um, more um, contracts from, you know, the, the council has a budget of half a million to 600 um, million. And um, I would allow local people like um, the Muslims in this area, black people in this area who have certain skills and certain resources and, you know, to produce, there are lots of creative people in Hackney. So they should, we should, they pay the council tax in Hackney, they, we should be able to um, have a fair opportunity of bidding for contracts to produce goods and services for the council. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I, I have a lot more hope than I think some of the people on this panel. I don't think it's a time of revelation. I think there is a work to do to keep our communities together. And I've said when we were responding to some of the dreadful terrorist attacks last year, whether at London Bridge, Manchester or Finsbury Park, we're only the tolerant, diverse borough that we are because we keep fighting to keep it that way. And that's what I've sought to do as mayor, and that's what I've sought to do in the policies that I set out in the manifesto and have delivered. So I made it very clear when I was first elected in 2016 there'd be no place for hate in Hackney. We'd have our own hate crime strategy, we wouldn't just rely on the London-wide one, we'd have a hate crime champion and we would be out there visible in our different faith uh, communities. That's why I've made a point of coming here four times. Closed meetings, public meetings, open days, the hustings this evening, making sure that your voices are heard and I've been visiting other mosques and faith communities while I've been doing that. And not just meeting community leaders, meeting genuine residents as well. I've created new programmes and support for ESOL, training, apprenticeships, targeted those towards harder to reach groups and making sure that we have a workforce in the borough, in Hackney Council, that looks like the types of communities that we serve, and that is paying dividends, and there are people in this room who have found employment and opportunity because of that work. We support things like Tell Mama, so when we have that target of Muslim Day, we sent our enforcement teams out from the council to reassure our mosques and make sure that they had points of contact if Islamophobia was rising. We led two debates in the council chamber and two very clear statements against Islamophobia and other types of hate 
here yeah. in Hackney. But we can always do more. And that's why I've said that culture and community are as important to the borough's infrastructure and well-being as our roads, parks, lights and other things. So I'm setting out how we use money from development to allow more organisations to come together to deliver projects. Finally, it's representation. I'm very proud there are six fantastic Muslim councillors standing as part of that 57, representing the diversity of Muslims in this borough, and I hope they're elected in Hackney Council. Hackney is made up of large faith-based communities like Muslim and Jewish communities. I, as a member of the Muslim community, better place to work with Muslim community at the grassroots level to tackle Islamophobia, hate crime, and improve community cohesion. I will create links with mosques, schools, police, local politicians, and stakeholders, and stakeholders, and other community organizations. I will also encourage Muslims to report more with Islamophobia attacks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm now going to pass the mic on to Imam Hashim. Just to introduce Imam Hashim, he's our new centre coordinator. Uh, so this is the first event he's actually organised with me. Um, Thank you, Imam. I have a question, regard, uh, a question which is of particular interest for both the Muslim and Jewish residents of Hackney. Muslim and Jewish residents amount for almost 20% of the population of Hackney. And both religions share a number, of, uh, a number of key issues. Chief amongst them is the requirement for deceased to be buried as quickly as possible. So the question is, how can we address the issue of a lack of burial spaces within the borough? And would you support a provision for creating more burial spaces for the residents of Hackney, especially given the cost of private burial, which can run into the thousands of pounds, and is which can run into the thousands of pounds, and which is not affordable for many residents of Hackney. Thank you. Would anyone like to answer the question? Um, well, that's one thing that I've been doing very recently is standing up for the communities in this borough against the uh, abandonment and, of, and introduction of the cap rank rule. So I've been making representations to the coroner's service, to uh, the Lord Chancellor and others to make sure that the, the coroner uh, that is funded by Tower Hamlets, Hackney, Islington and Camden actually responds to the needs uh, of the communities that they serve. And I know there have been some very tragic incidences from both communities, uh, and I really hope that the evidence of the legal case that's currently underway and the fact it's not really being contested is that we'll see real, uh, real progress there and a restoration of sensitive coroner services for the communities here in the borough. I think burial facilities in the borough, I'm going to be really honest, I don't think that's deliverable within the borders of Hackney. Uh, we've talked about it here before at the, the last public meeting. I think it's something that we need to work with the Mayor of London on around burial provision across London. If you think all the different pressures on Hackney's land, I'm not sure that I would reach for burial as the, most, the biggest priority. And I certainly wouldn't build on our parks to build new housing. It's about having a livable borough and a place that all of us can flourish. I think we do need to find a solution to this problem, though, because you articulate the real problems that the community is facing. Thank you, Harini. Yeah, um, in terms of the coroner's issue, I'd like to know more about, um, well, as mayor, I suppose, what I'd like to do is put some pressure, really, on the on central government to look at the rules about coroners. The Law Society Gazette was calling for review in 2015, and I believe there have been a series of incidents with this particular coroner. Um, so the system does need updating. And then in terms of burials, I think we're in, a, we've talked about the lovely different kinds of people in Hackney. So looking at the data today, I think we've got about 30% of people in Hackney saying that they have no religion, and um, a lot of Christians not necessarily so interested in burial anymore. So I would, I would still like to explore this issue further. People don't like to talk about death and dying in this country, and I think that's another aspect of lack of talking about caring. I would like to have a really frank conversation in Hackney before we give up on it, and find out which communities um, are not interested in burial anymore. 
and which communities, for maybe environmental reasons or because they don't practice a religion, really don't mind about cremation and other forms. And I'd also like to talk to your communities, and I, I'm ignorant on this at the moment, how, what possibilities there are for shared spaces, because I have found that some of the Christian graveyards in London are very beautiful outdoor places that, that you can enjoy. And so I don't know if they, I think I wouldn't want to give up on a solution because for certain people it's extremely important that they have a burial and I understand very much why bereaved relatives want that site to be close to home. But we've also got a lot of other people in Hackney who are not interested in burial. And um, burial grounds can be a beautiful green space. Thank you. Um, I think the, the, the issue that was raised is um, particularly concerning um, our Jewish friends and Muslim friends. The point I should make here is that unlike many other um, groups in this community, there are very strong religious um, prohibitions for, for example, um, cremation and, um, you know, for the Jewish um, community and the Muslim community, burial is absolutely essential. So in terms of, but just before I address that, I, I want to say that, um, you know, um, death and burial affects us all. And it affects the, 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 the Hindus, although, um, uh, um, no, not burial. <laughs> no, but um, for the Hindus, um, um, Cremation is um, uh, quite acceptable. The Chinese community, particularly those who have grown up or closely associated with China and now live here, cremation is also uh, acceptable. Um, and as you mentioned, within the general population, uh, cremation is also acceptable. But the point is, and this is what the real issue is, um, for the Jewish community and the Muslim community, cremation is absolutely prohibited. So how do we solve the problem of catering to our Jewish neighbors and Muslim neighbors? Well, we can do it two ways. We can either allocate land in the borders of Acne, or we find some other suitable um, land area to use as that specific burial purpose. And I would, as mayor, spend some time searching for suitable sites in the borders of Hackney to accommodate the Jewish and the Muslim community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. And the next question. Sorry, we just want to speak. Yeah, just quickly about on bail, um, that the London Borough of Tower Hamlet has bought land in Bromley mm -hmm. and purchased around six acres, which is roughly about 3,000 plots of um, uh, the Kenwell Park Cemetery, and its fixed rate has been agreed for the residents of around 650 pounds. So I would support that idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Moving, moving on to a slightly different subject, I'd like to bring up the issue of controlled parking. <laughs> so the implementation of controlled parking has raised a lot of questions. Um, and many residents are concerned about this, the cost of purchasing a permit. So the question that I'd like to ask is what assurances can you give to local residents that their voices are heard? And how would you change the current CPZ policy? Do you feel it could be changed so that local residents and businesses have a fairer and easier access to parking uh, on our roads within the borough? Okay. 
think residents in this area, Hackney Ward has already challenged the parking policy. I have managed to gather more than 700 signatures to challenge the park Hackney parking policy. The high parking charges we talked about because of the cost of living harm local sorts. And this is like in line with the guidelines and legislation. Uh, so Hackney parking policy could be even reaching their own um, the government legislations and their own parking policies, but they consulted here. I mean, the high prices and the parking policy, um, people here, they sent out like 11,000 letters in Stamford Hill just a couple of years ago, and 91% respondents rejected the parking cities. I think uh, this local, this Hackney um, labor government should take responsibility um, of this, that why people have rejected. Citizens are good uh, if they are implemented in the interest of residents and all road users and not used as cash cows. So, uh, and also, if I am elected, I will introduce free roaming scheme like the one in Islington, which allows between 11 and 3 um, for the residence permit holders to park freely around the borough um, into, the, into the base. And I will also reduce the parking permits by 50% for the average car. So, uh, this is what I think. Thank you. This is my second favourite beef. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Smile, Philip. <laughs> this is something that every time I knock the door, what are you going to do about parking? Yeah. What are you going to do about parking? I pay so much taxes, I pay this, I pay that, so I can't even park outside the front of my house. Well, I'd like to say to you, I've got the same problem. Because I've even got a disability blue badge. Now, having that is giving me problems because every three hours you have to come out and change the time. Now having a disability is not easy at the best of times. There's some days when I have to take triple the dose of morphine that I have to use to keep myself functioning. Now sometimes I might find myself a bit dozy first thing in the morning when I've got to run out at nine o'clock to change the tag on the badge. By three minutes late, I got a ticket. I was fuming. I went out ranting and raving. It's got to be fair. The prices for the tickets are way too high. And if you give me a £60 fine, the beginning of the month, when you've just paid all the bills at the end of last month, and you're not getting paid again till the following month, to the end of this month, where am I going to get 120 in two weeks? Because that's what happens. It starts at 60, then two weeks it goes up another 60, and then it goes... Why does it have to go up another 60? Why does it have to double? Why can it not just be maybe a £5 fine? You know, this is taking money away from the families that are already struggling out there. So the more money we're putting back into the road, thank you, the more aggravating it is. And until we connect properly and get our lovely mayor here and the Labour councillors to understand, we have to address this because it's becoming a big problem. We pay too much to keep a car on the road as it is, and then to have to give half of your wages away to fines is ridiculous. So I'm with you on what you're saying. We're at the moment still working out where the funding's coming from, and having not seen what our expenditure is... 10 seconds? That's eight now. Okay. And having not seen what the expenditure is for this, until then, we won't be able to get an exact pricing, but we will knock it on the head. Okay? Well, I'm on the side of residents. I'm on the side of residents that all of our CPZs, wherever they are in the borough, have always been resident-led. We do not consult areas that haven't petitioned to want to see an introduction to CPZs in their area. The only answer in London to being able to park outside your own home, given the parking stress 
and population growth we have in our capital, RCPZs. That's what protects streets for residents. That's who I'm on the side of. The only 34% though of Hackney residents have a car. So I'm also on the side of 66% of Hackney residents that don't have a car, that can't afford a car, that don't, isn't, aren't able to access a car and rely on public transport, walking and cycling. And if you reduce permits in this borough, you put the burden of the parking system and our transport infrastructure away from those that have a car and onto those that can't afford it, that pay council tax and other taxes. London no longer gets any car tax income to spend on people on the roads. So the Mayor of London doesn't get it, and the, and the Mayor of Hackney doesn't get it. So you pay, as Pauline has said, to keep your car on the road for car tax. None of that money is now going to London. It's going to other parts of the country. So the frustrations about road infrastructure in terms of potholes and other things, they should be directed towards the government. When we introduce them, we listen to residents about the shape of them, and the hours they operate. And if we're talking about the CPZ that we're sat in now, which is the CPZ Zone T, we're now listening to residents about increasing the size of that zone and possibly increasing it again. After that process, we will come back, look at the implementation and look at the hours and hopefully come to an accommodation with local residents. That's a listening council that is introducing CPZs on behalf of local residents. The other people that benefit are businesses and the disabled because if you get the people that are commuting to the area out of those streets then there's more car parking space for those that do need to use them. And I think it's absolutely disgusting what the Conservatives have proposed tonight. They are cutting CPZ charges for average cars, they're cutting it on the most high polluting cars, diesel cars, that are ultimately affecting our health and killing our children. And that's an absolute disgrace. without talking about the wider transport strategy and we can't talk about cars without talking about air pollution in Hackney and the effect that it's having on our children and on all of us. I used to have a car when my children were small and I share your frustration. You go and see your parents out of town or you just go to do the shopping, you come back and you can't park near your door and you're alone and you think, how am I going to carry six bags of shopping? Is the baby too old to leave alone in the car seat while I go around the corner? What about the other two children? It's even worse if you've got a disability. Um, some however, people some, people, some people need a car, some people don't. I gave up my car five years ago, and we walk a lot. In London, we have a very low rate of women cycling compared to men cycling. I'm one of those women that knows how to ride a bike and is too scared to take her children on the back of it or even myself to go through the traffic. If you look at a city like Cambridge, there are far greater numbers of women cycling. Unfortunately, it's still mainly women taking their children to and from school. We can't talk about who needs a car and who really needs a car unless we talk about other kinds of transport. And we need to change the culture on our roads. It's not enough to say people don't need a car, they can cycle. And I'm not afraid to say that bringing down air pollution and improving people's health in Hackney is a top priority for me. And we can only do that by cutting private car use. At the moment, it's a great source of revenue, but what it means is it's the people with the most money that can afford to have a private car and to park, and I think that that's wrong. I want to move to a system where the people who are able to park are the people who really need a car, and to me that's people with young children, people with disabilities, and people who are caring for others. And so I would like to have a consultation about that and be really open and frank about the need to reduce private car use. And can I just say, it's really not fair to be judgmental to people whether you've got a car or not. The Queen's got a palace and I haven't got one, so hey, you know, at the end of the day, a man lives to his means. You know, I've been five years without one, my disabilities have got worse and I feel really grateful that I've been helped to get a car to get around. So remember, the question here was about parking. It wasn't about whether someone's entitled to a car, should have a car, shouldn't have a car. Cars are out there and if the whole of this room decide to sell their cars tomorrow, there'll be a billion that will go and buy new ones. So let's get this thing on the right level and keep it real. Thank you. Question from the audience. Yeah,
Can I, can I just quickly add, just very quickly, because I've not got a huge amount to add to this. Um, I just want to say that um, uh, I'm not entirely convinced what Philip was saying about uh, the consultations. I think some of these consultations go out and there's already a plan in mind and they you know, get a very small select group of people responding and there's not a bit more of an active uh, consultation. So I think that's really important to do. <laughs> We, we do need to make sure that we're trying all different measures to reduce the amount of the, the reliance on car use because the equivalent of 9,000 people a year are dying in Hackney because of the air pollution and, and that's affecting the young people the worst, you know, when they're growing up in their schools and they're affecting their, their young. But we need to look at what alternatives we're providing for people. Like, how can we improve public transport? How can we improve higher cars? Things like that. And, um, and we just need to, also, when we uh, take those charges, I think we need to be really honest and open with residents about what it's being spent on as well. Thank you. Before I open. Sorry. Sorry. Why do you keep forgetting me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, do you have to put your hands up? Okay, hand up. okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, it was supposed yeah. to try and skip some of the yeah. answering questions. Right. I, right. To the question. I, I, I think what we forget is that parking is controlled by the law. Um, you know, in terms of uh, parking zones and um, CPZs, um, they're, um, they're controlled by Acts of Parliament and statutory instrument. And the, when the council wishes to, uh, you know, look at um, zoning an area, it has to follow the law. And part of that is consultation. Now, I have come across many people in Hackney who complain that the council has basically, um, you know, has, has rigged the, the consultation. And um, that may well relate to what, um, you know, I said that. Now, the fact is that generally, when you wish to challenge the council's decision about parking, your only alternative is to spend a lot of money on solicitors and possibly judicial review. So people simply don't have the means to properly challenge the council. Therefore, the council has to make extra care, extra sure that its process of consultation is what it is. Consultation, not rigging the process of consultation. If people want a car, if people want parking zone in their area, and so they should be the ones who decide it, do. not the council. That's what we do. <coughs> Thank you. Before I open, before I open up to the floor to ask their questions, there's one question that I wanted to ask, and it's a question that was sent to us by email. It's regarding homelessness in Hackney. An article in the Guardian today. Made, a shock, made shocking reading saying that the health and death outcomes of homeless people is far worse than those who are not homeless. So my question to the candidates is, what would the candidates do to deal with both the causes and effects of homelessness? And also, what would you do as a candidate to end homelessness within the borough? The Homeless Reduction, Homelessness Reduction Act has just come into law so how will you ensure it is implemented so that the most vulnerable people in our community have a home and the support that they need? I think it's a disgrace that we live in the sixth richest city in the world and that we still have homelessness. When I was growing up, I had never seen a person sleeping outdoors until I was taken by my parents to visit India. And now this is routine for my children and it's not acceptable. There are many causes why men, who, who are the ones we tend to see visible, become homeless. And it relates back a lot to the, court, the things we talked about when we were talking about violence, the role of men in society, opportunities for gainful employment and training, and just caring for men. In Hackney, we actually have a life expectancy gap between men and women of about 18, uh, 18 months, which is also unacceptable to me. There's some very interesting research from Sweden, which has a long history of many decades where men have got much greater paternity leave rights and are much more involved in family life, even though they're also working. They've narrowed the gap. It's the narrowest in the world. Men and women in Sweden are still living as long as each other. So coming back to the issues of those are many issues where we could intervene in terms of men's homelessness, but actually, 
Three quarters of all homeless households in this country are lone parent households, and nearly all of those are headed by women. Women tend not to be seen sleeping in the streets because they're worried about violence on the streets. You might have seen the newspaper reports recently where men who, who I think are pimps are offering rooms for rent and the rent is sex, which to me is a kind of prostitution. Some investigative journalists have been writing about this in Huffington Post and the mainstream news. Women's homelessness tends to be hidden because women are pushed into really terrible situations. And that's why it's, it's one of our policies is that I'll say no to unaffordable and temporary housing for lone parents. We've talked a lot about community issues and the importance of youth. We need to invest in the most vulnerable people. And I think our housing strategy should be open about that. One of the things, um, if you have time, I mean, there are many things I want to do in terms of building community housing. Um, introducing a register of landlords so that all landlords have to buy by minimum standards and people who are not really offering a property for rent, who are really looking for some, an opportunity to commit a crime of violence, will not be able to call themselves landlords. There's, there's a great deal that the council can do. If we look at, um, for example, the bedroom tax and all those changes to local housing allowance, they've impacted worst on women and so often those women are the heads of households looking after children on their own. to me again. Homelessness for me, it breaks my heart every time I walk down the high road. St John's of Hackney, round the back there, you must have seen people there with their beds. Where they're so particular, they have their space, they fold it up, they store it away for the, for the, during the day so that they can go around doing their hustling and then come back to it at night. Sometimes they find their little stash of belongings has gone. So then they have to start again. The life out there, especially during this time of crisis with the weather we've had, they have been really struggling out there. So we have to be mindful, again, as a community, to be inclusive. A lot of these people started out like everyday Joe blogs like you and me. We, they had a normal life, born into a normal family, doing normal things. But as we know, life has its tips and turns. So it can change at any second. So your life circumstances change. So we find ourselves walking down the road, looking down our nose at these people. We mustn't exclude them from society. They need us to draw them in and support them. And it's crucially important that we start from here where the council is, where the council can be in a position to put more housing out there. I would like to see housing of a sort, because most of these homeless people, they can't survive on their own. They can't manage to um, take a home and, and maintain it because of the levels of where their mind's at. So I would like to see units where maybe they, you get three or four renting a home and they become a support to each other because they do it out on the streets anyway. They totally look out for each other out there. So let's try and find solutions that will support them and help them to move on into a natural living environment. And I have to say I agree with a lot of what uh, Pauline has said. The complex causes of homelessness uh, are known to a lot of us, but if you go back to what has happened in the last eight years, you cannot fail to look at the statistics. Homelessness in Hackney has gone up 300% since 2010, and it's gone up because of failure of national government to invest in social housing, They've cut welfare, welfare benefits and they fail to regulate the private rented sector. And they have been absolutely disgusting in their pursuit of migrants and refugees, withdrawing uh, recourse to public funds and ensuring that people are, are left with only the option of being on the street. So to unpick all that actually will require a Labour government. But back here in Hackney, we're doing a lot to support people that are living on the streets. We have the Greenhouse, which is a single homelessness hub based with the NHS in Mare Street. We've been pioneering no first night out, so working with those that are at risk of homelessness, that are sofa surfing, uh, that, that may be being found spending longer in our libraries on public transport, clearly unable to go back to where they live, and trying to unpick that before they're sleeping rough in the first place. We're now working with the Mayor of London to bring the North East London No Second Night Out Hub 
uh, here to Hackney to make sure that there's more capacity and support to get people off the streets. Because as others have said, the life expectancy of somebody on the street uh, is a lot lower than somebody uh, in proper accommodation and support, so we're doing that. I know we need to do more though, and that's why I've set out in the manifesto that we will have a homelessness strategy that ends uh, homelessness in Hackney, uh, street homelessness by 2022. There will always be those that end up rough sleeping, but it's how we work with those to get them off the street and into proper accommodation, and that's what we're working on. Ultimately though, we also need to build more homes. Visible street homelessness is only the tip of the iceberg. There are 3,000 families placed by Hackney in temporary accommodation this evening because of all those impacts of government austerity over the last uh, 10 years. And it's those people that we also need to help because we can create better pathways and better uh, lives for people in permanent accommodation. So it's not just visible rough sleeping, it's hidden homelessness. Yes. And you've seen the, uh, the fantastic campaign that I fully support uh, by the Hackney Gazette of highlighting those sorts of issues. Saying stuff, uh, the, the, the central government's going to sort anything out, it's just not going to happen because we've got uh, the Brexit negotiations going on, all, all legislation is stopped, okay? So the, the fight that's been going on within the Tory party, within Labour, they're tearing themselves apart and they've, they've put us in a situation where unless we do something, uh, then nothing's going to happen. Central government is stuck, it's in a, it's in a quagmire, we, we've got to do something ourselves. Um, it's about doing stuff in the community. I volunteer with the um, Hackney Winter Night Shelter, and it's an amazing organisation. You know, they have like every night during the winter for you know months on end, they have like 30 people coming in, volunteering their time on shifts. You know, setting up, getting people you know food and dinner and breakfast, and, and looking after them. And it's an incredible organisation. We need to work with those organisations and other expert organisations rather than just sort of picking ideas out of the air. We need to, to, to listen to what people on the ground are actually aware of. Um, we need to make sure we're not treating uh, homeless people like second-class citizens. There was a, a massive outcry when um, it, was, it looked as if uh, the Hackney Council was going to use public space protection orders to basically make homeless people illegal. And it was really good that the community came together and said, no, that is unacceptable to us and we're, and we're not going to have it. So uh, we pledged not to, not to do that. In terms of house, house building, um, it's all well and good building houses, but if you're only building houses uh, that are unaffordable, then it's not going to help anyone who's, who's at risk of homelessness. So we need a guarantee of what percentage is going to be um, uh, affordable and truly affordable housing and, and the Green Party we are pledging to 60% uh, truly affordable housing in all new developments. Um, I have spent the last four years going out, meeting homeless people, talking to them, trying to understand the root of their homelessness. And you know, with all due respect, not one panel member actually addressed specifically how you can solve the problem of homelessness. Not one. Now, in my manifesto, I have called it war and homelessness. And I've put very specific um, measures to solve the problem in Hackney. Um, before saying that, you must remember the you know the stereotypical view of homelessness is just does not exist. I have met many working people who are homeless. You know, they, they struggle to basically continue to be homeless, get up in the morning, um, go to work, come back home um, to their friend's house or or, or their family house or you know, sleep on the floor, whatever. So, in fact, it basically involves people who are just like you and me. They have a home. Um, the, the very specific things that I have suggested in my manifesto, based some of it on talking actually to people who are homeless, who basically tells me, look, the most important thing for us as being homeless is our independence. This is why they say we would rather sleep on the streets than go into some of those hostels. Okay? Um, and so I have come up with some very specific solutions. One, um, build uh, 500 um, Shelley Lights units on the edges of Parkland in Hackney. 
it would cost roughly um, you know, between two and three thousand pounds to put up some prefabs that would give someone a living space that is warm, secure, and comfortable. Two, I would, as mayor, insist that every single housing association in Hackney have a specific board member that is responsible for housing. That would go a long way to solving the homelessness in Hackney. Thank you.